Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Modernize Your Data Architecture to Deliver Oracle as a Service, sponsored today by Robin Systems. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Rob Martin. Rob is a solution engineer at Robin Systems with more than 25 years of experience with Oracle technologies. Prior to joining Oracle in 1994, he worked in both application development and database administration amid Oracle's database and tools ecosystem across multiple operating environments. Having spent more than 23 years as an Oracle solution engineer and enterprise architect, he is well-versed in Oracle's core data platform strategy as it relates to both on-premise and cloud-based deployment models. At Robin, he focuses his focus includes specializing in the benefits of com uh, containerization with the Oracle community by demonstrating the value of Robin's software-defined application orchestration framework and its ability to provide rapid service provisioning and lifecycle management for the entire Oracle stack. So with that, let me turn it over to Rob to get our webinar started. Hello and welcome. Yeah, thanks, Shannon. Uh, yeah, thank you and, and thanks, everybody, uh, for this opportunity to introduce you to the Robin platform. Um, Basically, in a nutshell, I mean, I think some of you have probably perhaps heard of Robin, but but many of you perhaps have not. Uh, you know, in a nutshell, Robin makes it extraordinarily easy to deploy any any application uh, on containers. Um, our real uh, bread and butter happens to be focusing on uh, data heavy type workloads, stateful workloads, uh, of which obviously Oracle is is a is a big part. Um, throughout you know the whole ecosystem of data heavy data intensive type applications including those you know in the big data landscape uh, you know AI ML type uh, pipelines any, anything uh, you know that requires uh, storage persistence network state persistence these things have historically been pretty challenging to uh, you know to be able to containerize successfully and and so what Robin brings to the table is is uh, essentially a, a viable kubernetes platform viable for those you know those types of uh, those types of applications and so we've you know we've coined this phrase hyperconverged kubernetes many folks ask where this comes from uh, in fact sometimes it, uh, it it tends to uh, communicate this notion that that you know robin provides an appliance uh, robin is actually a software only stack uh, it in fact was the first and is is still the only uh, the only Kubernetes distribution, if you will, that, that combines its own software-defined block storage stack. It's uh, actually an application-aware uh, storage stack, you know, along with the networking virtualization and the containerized uh, compute virtualization that uh, obviously Kubernetes is, is, is well known for. But, but what Robin does is it, it solves a lot of the complexity challenges, a lot of the technological gaps inherent in Kubernetes with its ability to, uh, you know, to, to be viable for stateful apps. And so that's where, that's where Robin tends to, tends to focus. So today, of course, we're focusing on, on Oracle. Uh, Oracle is just one of many uh, software stacks uh, that, uh, you know, Robin can support. And uh, of course, you know, Oracle's tried and true, been around forever, uh, a very widely and deeply trusted technology, of course. Uh, very well proven with its you know ability to support mission critical apps um, of course being SQL based you know who doesn't know SQL right so it's it's, it's got that familiar sort of language um, you know the the track record speaks for itself there's a lot of history in Oracle there's a lot of maturity and, and not just from a product maturity and, and, and proven you know uh, from the standpoint of, of having a proven track record but you know arguably Oracle is one of the most uh, innovative you know database platforms out there right so um, very widely adopted, um, and therefore, you know, you could probably throw a rock in any direction and hit a DBA or a or an Oracle developer, right? So very easy to uh, you know to find find the skill sets needed to uh, to either develop applications on, on on Oracle or to you know run Oracle databases, and of course with its long uh, storied history, you know, there's of course a, a an, an enormous you know partner ecosystem with Oracle, so. Um, so a lot of history there and a lot of uh, a lot of success. 
but with that, um, you know, like with any sophisticated, you know, database management system, there, there are challenges, there are complexities, um, you know, whether it be around provisioning, right? I mean, any DBA that's been around Oracle for a long time will, will probably be able to say, well, you know, installing Oracle is not that big of a deal, right? Uh, depends on whether, you know, whether Rack is involved and, and, and how much interaction there needs to be with the sysadmin folks, the storage admin, network admin folks to kind of orchestrate all that's necessary to get the infrastructure in place in prep for that type of an install. Um, but all of the mechanics aside, right, typically there's a lot of, uh, um, uh, a lot of time spent just in the approval process, right? In any large organization, there's typically a lot of um, you know, a large workflow associated with submitting a request to provision a new Oracle database uh, installation. Um, and, and then once, you know, once provisioned, you have other, you know, you have other types of activities, uh, administrative type activities, dev tests, you know, refreshes, clones, um, you know, e even if it's just a core, a core tech type environment and EBS, something like, you know, eBusiness Suite isn't involved. You still have, you know, quite often uh, a, a, a continual need um, for, for being able to rapidly not just provision new systems, but to, uh, to you know, to stay on top of the periodic refreshes that, um, that are, you know, that are demanded. Um, from a, from a, you know, hardware cost perspective, right? I mean, this is always a challenge associated with, uh, with Oracle. Um, you know, as you as you continue to 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 clone and and manage and stand up new systems to stand up new projects, et cetera, right? You invariably result in a certain degree of of sprawl, okay? And um, and you know that whole siloed challenge that uh, is an age old challenge. You know, Oracle itself in 10G sought to to address this with the whole grid you know grid computing model where you know rack was really uh, you know maturing and and, and allowing for a, a great degree of consolidation of applications into a single, you know, single database cluster. There's been all kinds of initiatives, whether it be from vendors uh, like Oracle or partners of Oracle, uh, to try to address these types of challenges. Uh, and of course, there's licensing challenges, obviously, that uh, that are associated with this as, as well as a function of the sprawl of that hardware in, in uh, you know, in response to having to stand up uh, more and more databases throughout the, you know, throughout the uh, uh, you know the IT landscape. Uh, remaining elastic, right? Being able to respond quickly, dynamically to the changes in computing demands, uh, whether it be from a CPU or memory perspective, right? So being able to dynamically and elastically scale up, scale it down, uh, as you have uh, clustered type deployments, being able to scale out, scale back in, right? This is almost dovetails in with the previous bullet, right? Where, you, where you're you're wanting to make maximum use of the of the infrastructure to get the most out of that infrastructure, right? Without uh, you know wasteful provisioning, um, business continuity, right? From the standpoint of being able to ensure uptime, uh, there's all kinds of uh, technologies out there from storage vendors. Uh, server vendors, you know, around clustering and, and so forth to, to address business continuity. Uh, Oracle obviously itself has, has real application clusters to address HA. Um, you know, there's lots of ways to skin that cat. There's, there's typically additional investment involved and, and uh, there's, there's invariably going to be uh, additional complexity involved um, depending on which of these technologies is, is employed, right? So, but in any event, HA is typically some concern to some degree or another, even for those, you know, SLAs, which aren't really stringent, uh, you know, HA is, is, is at least, you know, a lingering, you know, a lingering thought, lingering concern there uh, that needs to be addressed. And then finally, from a cloud migration perspective, cloud is obviously increasingly popular. There's folks that either are making wholesale shifts to the cloud or they're just, you know, dipping their toes in the cloud. Uh, there's a, there's a fundamental need to be able to uh, move to the cloud and back out to on-prem or do something in between, to move across cloud. Uh, with that comes challenges associated with migrating applications. And in this context, migrating the application uh, or the Oracle database uh, from on-prem into the cloud as, as folks seek to, uh, you know, to embrace that, that type of a deployment model. Okay, so what's needed basically here is, is, is this notion of, you know, database as a service, an agile, you know, Oracle as a service type model. Uh, development and QA, you know, they want self-service provisioning. They want it, you know, such that it can be done very, very quickly, uh, you know, without having to go through all the red tape and 
necessarily, uh, you know, typical uh, as part of that part of that process uh, through you know corporate processes. Uh, they want simplified, you know, management, streamlined management of those environments uh, to go along with that quick self-service provisioning. And they need performance, right? Performance optimization. From an IT perspective, uh, platform standardization is uh, is is particularly interesting, right? It's it's challenging for for DBAs to have to manage databases across multiple multiple operating systems, multiple platforms. So some sort of standardization uh, is always a great value um, from an IT you know an ops perspective uh, across platforms. Uh, maintenance and support, lowering the cost associated with these, streamlining that, um, you know, and and freeing up their their cycles to to be able to innovate right um, is is also you know, is also critical cost reduction it being highly you know regarded as a as essentially a cost center uh, there's always always pressure to uh, you know to control costs cut costs uh, from from that standpoint and then from a business perspective it's all about you know again innovation but you know faster time to market generating new uh, you know new ideas and from those ideas um, uh, to uh, you know, to produce you know new innovative uh, products to the market, right? Faster time to value the market, um, and then obviously you know cost reduction and 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 building out a a platform uh, that's that's going to have legs, right? That's you know from a longevity perspective, future proofing that platform, um, you know to make that investment uh, really really count in the long run. So. <clears throat> You know, so how can Robin help? Well, I mean, Robin essentially provides, uh, you know, as was uh, you know stated initially, right? It's it's a software-defined application orchestration framework. Uh, it's a unified platform that provides uh, really everything in, in a single a single stack. Um, it provides really uniquely the ability to you know empower users with their own self-service rapid provisioning capability. So. You know, deploying things like Oracle database homes, databases therein, you know, as much as an order of magnitude faster um, through through that process than you know than is uh, otherwise available. Uh, being able to do lifecycle management tasks, then you know, subsequent to that initial provisioning, being able to snap uh, not just the storage, but to be able to snap the entire application. In this case, snap the entire home, uh, including all the you know all the various uh, capacity settings. Uh, in the case of rack, the topology of the of the cluster, right? Whether it's a two, three, four, six, twenty node cluster, uh, and and then being able to clone that uh, for for whatever purpose, right? Whether it's a, a typical refresh type operation, or or perhaps uh, a matter of wanting to clone an environment for uh, from production to dev uh, to dev test in order to be able to you know perhaps reproduce a problem that might have been encountered in production. Um, and then, you know, making good on the promises of, of containerization and virtualization, right, to the extent that folks really try to make good on that by, by truly consolidating and, uh, you know, doing more with less infrastructure, consolidating densely. You can, uh, you've got the inherent capability with containers to be able to consolidate much more densely than you can with, uh, you know, with a hypervisor-based virtualization strategy. And so, you know, there's a lot of promise there. And uh, but but unfortunately, without the ability to provide any sort of workload management or resource management capability, a quality of service type layer in there to ensure that all these disparate workloads that that might have previously been running on silos, right, in their own uh, in their own isolated fashion, bringing those all into a, a single uh, shared grid type uh, deployment model. You know, now you're looking at at uh, that noisy neighbor effect that, that typically is going to ensue, right? All those disparate workloads are, are conceivably going to start stepping on one another, right? So having a mechanism in there, a uh, quality of service management piece for being able to guarantee SLAs, to be able to guarantee that those, all those workloads are going to play, you know, play nicely together is, is, is critical. And that's uh, something else that Robin brings to the table. Um, and, and dynamic scaling up, scaling down, scaling out, scaling in, regardless of the application. And this, uh, presentation we're focusing on Oracle, but but again, Robin can support any application workload, any distributed application, any composite, you know, type uh, type stack. Um, you know, Rack is the best example in the context of Oracle, in which you know it's clustered, and so you know being able to to scale that out, 
very dynamically, just as you might need to scale it up or back in or back in, uh, back down uh, is, uh, is is key. Um, and for for those folks who aren't necessarily in, uh, adopting RAC, whether it be you know for cost reasons, for for you know for whatever kinds of reasons, there may still be the need for HA. And so uh, you know, Robin brings inherent HA to the equation simply by the, the fact that it it enforces uh, it, the containers running in the Robin platform to always be up and running. So in the case of a single instance Oracle uh, database, should the container fail? Uh, for whatever reason, uh, you know, Robin automatically ensures that that container will be restarted somewhere else in the cluster. And through its AppAware storage layer, right, uh, is is further able to guarantee that uh, through its persistent storage mechanisms, you know, is going to be able to bring Oracle back up successfully somewhere else in, you know, in that cluster. And then finally, the ability to ease ease that process for you know for making that step into the cloud for migrating an application from on-prem into the cloud uh running hybrid cloud running you know multi-cloud etc uh we, you know we help to help to make that simpler as well okay so so let's uh take a look at you know, one of the first uh, the first key value propositions here around uh you know being able to empower users with their own self-service provisioning capability so when you pull up Robin, basically Robin presents a, a marketplace-like feel, um, sort of this app store-like interface, if you will, through the console, um, whereby any user, you know, any consumer of any one of these, you know, these technologies can very easily simply click on, on that application. And then upon doing that, they're presented with the provisioning workflow. And this is a consistent workflow regardless of whether it's Oracle uh, Oracle single instance, Rack, uh, or any any other any other application. This uh, in the center here of the screen is is what that you know what that workflow begins to look like, where you're you know you, you're given the opportunity to give the application a name. You know it might be like my Oracle database for example. Uh, you choose the network settings. You've got some various uh, other settings here around uh, storage. Uh, the compute, the memory sizing, and this just happens to be a rack database, and so you're you're able to specify the number of uh, rack nodes in the cluster. But these are you know these are just a few simple inputs, m most if not all of which are actually defaulted according to a YAML file that's part of uh, part of what we call a bundle. Um, so behind each one of these applications, uh, Oracle, Elk, Hortonworks, whatever, there's there's what we call a bundle, and that bundle is comprised of a, a manifest file. It's the YAML file that, that is used to render this, this dialog in the center of the screen. Um, it defaults uh, pretty much all of these values, uh, but through the workflow provisioning process, you can easily come in here and tweak, you know, tweak some of these values, change the sizing, change the number of, you know, compute cores, memory, et cetera, whatever, um, and then specify anything else that might be, you know, particularly relevant to you know this application, right? So in this case, it's it's rack. So uh, and as actually, as you'll see here coming up in the demo, you, you have provision for uh, specifying both the public and the private IP address. Um, you know the scan. You know some of the things that are that are unique to this particular application. But the point is that that there's a there's a consistent you know process by which any of these application stacks can be uh, the provisioning for these can be rendered um, to uh, to the end consumer of that technology to very easily, you know, just just pick the app, uh, perhaps make a few tweaks to some of these inputs, and then simply click provision application. And upon doing so, then Robin automatically provisions all the storage necessary. Right in this case, if it's rack, it's it, it, it's using ASM, for example. And under ASM, as as most, if not all of you are aware, there's there's raw storage needed. Um, Robin handles raw storage just as well as it, it handles, you know, cooked file system uh, type type storage. It does all of this, and so it provisions all the storage volumes according to the inputs on on the uh, on that screen, and then uh, also uh, according to these inputs, it provisions the number of containers needed. Obviously, there's going to be one container for each of the rack nodes. Um, and each of those containers is going to be allocated, you know, the certain amount of compute and uh, and memory capacity as defined uh, here as well. And so that's it. And from a rack, you know, perspective, for example, everything's done for you. The the entire installation from the ground up, everything that which otherwise would have required, 
you know, coordination with storage admins to present, you know, raw, uh, raw storage to the nodes um, that you're going to be using to form that, that cluster under the rack installation. Uh, you know, the networking configuration of the, of the public and the private interfaces on all the nodes, you know, all that has to be coordinated with, with those sysadmins. Uh, and then, uh, and then from just from a pure Oracle installation perspective, right, you're installing the grid infrastructure and ASM, and then you're installing the Oracle binaries and rack uh, and creation of the database. You know, there's lots of steps in there. All of that is, is being compressed and, and abstracted into, into just this, literally this screen here. Um, and again, upon clicking provision app, then, you know, you, you literally in minutes have an entire, you know, standalone, fresh, new uh, Oracle installation running you know, in this case, uh, you know, a rack, a rack database. Okay. So let me just uh, jump over here and show y'all what, uh, what that looks like. Um, so here I'm going to log in as Robin to the Robin console. And uh, upon doing so, you know, I'm brought to the, uh, I'm brought to the dashboard here, but what we're going to do is we're going to jump straight over to uh, our application bundle screen. This will be you know, consistent with what you just saw uh, on that slide here, but in this case, we just have a couple of bundles uh, added to this particular cluster. And if I click on that application, uh, that rack uh, app, so to speak, then here's that, uh, you know, here's that dialog that's rendered from the manifest file. And so you know, I give my app a name, and uh, I've got my different uh, IP pools that have been created here. I've got one, um, you can disregard the default, that's actually a Calico um, network pool. But I have both a public and an IP, uh, I'm sorry, a private uh, I IP pools created here. Uh, and then I go in and I just decide I want a two node rack database and I can take the defaults here. Um, for storage, the defaults in this particular bundle happen to be set to solid state flash drives. Uh, in this particular cluster, I did not have enough flash uh, available, so I'm going to just switch these over to spinning disks, but I can keep the sizes there. And then I've got some additional, um, you know, parameters here. This is where I would specify the private, uh, the private interconnect, and uh, and actually I had forgotten to uh, to specify the scan. So I've got some additional resources here, uh, you know, obviously specific to rack. So I specify the single client ac access name, and then I come down in here, and I've got some other environment variables. So the bundle, you know, this bundling concept is an open concept. You, you, you know, you can create your own bundles. We have reference bundles that are provided with the product. Um, but through the bundle and through the manifest, you're able to pass in parameters. Uh, again, they can be defaulted or, or changed. And then another really key thing about Robin is the ability to control the placement of the resources out on the physical cluster. And I had to change this here because I only have a, a two node physical cluster for Robin for this demo. Um, and I had a rule set in place there that, um, that would not allow me to put more than one rack instance on, on, on the same physical node. Um, and I need to be able to disable that because in a later demo, I'm going to scale out. So uh, it would have failed had I had I had a rule in place that um, that would prevent me from doing that. But but that's another really interesting uh, capability with Robin is because of all the IP that's been invested in the built in storage stack and the fact that the storage is app aware, we can do some very creative things uh, around placement rules, you know, whether it be uh, data locality, isolation constraints or what have you, which is really important. So then I have my, uh, my rack database is created now. I have a two node rack database and, um, and I've, I can see the two containers that, uh, that represent each of those uh, rack nodes. And I can see some of the information, the IP addressing for those, the public and the private, the actual host name that, that was given, uh, the physical Robin host on which each is running. And we make it very easy to jump down into the container by simply clicking on one, any, either one of those containers and, and clicking on the console. And so now I'm brought actually inside the container. I'll just, uh, you know, log in as Oracle and I'll set my environment. And I just want to show you all real quickly that, uh, you know, that we do in fact have a, have a rack database up and running now. So I set the environment and then, you know, for those of you that are, you know, familiar with, uh, you know, with Rack, um, I'm just going to use SRVCTL here to do a status on the database. 
Uh, the database was named Robin. That was just something that was passed in from the bundle. Again, that could have been changed at the time we deployed. So you can see here we've got our two REC instances, Robin 1 and Robin 2, uh, each running on the uh, two uh, um, container nodes, the virtual nodes that, uh, that we provisioned as part of the Oracle provisioning process in this case. And I can just go ahead and uh, connect to SQL Plus and do something similar by you know, querying uh, v-dollar view to again show that uh, you know that we have a rack database up here that's you know basically you know a fully functional rack database. Okay, so we've got two instances that are both active on that shared database, and I can just exit out of this, and then. Uh, and then that basically that's it. You know, provisioning an Oracle Rack database was was literally as simple as as uh, you know as what y'all just saw there. Okay. So moving on, then let's look at uh, let's look at refreshing. Okay. So you know, Robin again is is unique in its ability to provide um, its you know through its AppAware storage, it uniquely provides for snapshotting and, and thin cloning uh, of the entire stack. All right. So if you look at traditional uh, approaches to, to doing you know, database refreshes with Oracle, right? typically you're looking at one of two options. You're gonna, of course, there's a number of utilities that are, that are, that are available for, for doing cloning. Um, RMAN duplicate you know, might be one approach for, for creating, a, you know, creating a clone of a database. You might be you know, doing data you know, export, import, data pump, you know, what have you. Uh, those would be two fundamentally different approaches and, and where you would might, you know, probably need to make a decision, you know, based on any kind of implications there may be for the application for doing one over the other. You know, a lot of folks typically will do for that very reason because it's less invasive to the application or, or provides or there's, you know, there's less implication with respect to the application will opt for, for doing a full, full database copy. Well, the problem with that, right, is, is sprawl, right? So, you know, typically what folks will do is to, to offload the the uh, the stress on that production database. They'll first create a you know create a copy. They'll create a gold copy, so to speak, and then from that gold copy, they'll start to create you know downstream dev test type clones of of that environment. Well, for every time you do this, of course, you're you know you're you're essentially replicating the entire uh, the entire database, and um, more specifically, you're consuming that much additional space uh, and, and storage real estate, right? Very, very costly, very expensive. Uh, you can't always count on these organizations to tear down their, you know, their environments when they're finished. And so before you know it, you know, you just, it, it gets out of control, right? But what if you could do the same thing, right? You could effect the same exact cloning process, um, but without that storage penalty, okay? So that's where Robin comes into play, right? So with Robin, what you would first do is you'd create a, a snapshot, okay? And, and Robin does uh, redirect on write uh, as, as far as its approach to doing, doing snapshots. And so what you're doing here is you're snapping the entire, the entire stack. You're, you're snapping all the volumes that are associated with your database, right? You're, all your different data volumes, but you're also snapping the root disk and you're snapping your Oracle home, thereby capturing you know, the installation, the Oracle binaries. Okay, but on top of that, we're capturing in that snapshot, we're capturing all the QoS settings, we're capturing all the, you know, the, the settings for compute and memory. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're capturing every, every characteristic of that database because that can evolve over time, right? Again, there's a lot of self-service um, um, available here in, in all those regards and being able to make, you know, make changes in all those regards. And so, you know, we're capturing all that as part of that snapshot and then subsequently thin cloning off of that snapshot. Okay, so uh, these thin clones can be shared with other organizations for whatever reason, but the point here is that uh, upon doing so, you know, you're consuming a fraction of the space, a, a fraction of that storage out there, right? You've got minimal uh, impact uh, from doing the snapshot itself based on the redirect on write uh, approach versus copy on write, for example. Uh, but you're also, uh, you know, you're also, um, you know, minimizing the amount of space consumed as a, as a function of, of creating all these copies. So you can create numerous copies here, you know, with, uh, you know, with minimal, minimal storage utilization. Okay. So let's see. Yeah, I think, uh, so let me jump over again and, and show you an example of that. Um, 
So, you know, again, I'm using Rack here. Not all of you may be, you know, Rack, you know, Rack users. Uh, main reason I'm using Rack as an example here is because it does tend to be harder to, you know, a harder nut to, to crack uh, when doing any of this, whether it's initial provisioning um, or, you know, things like what we're continuing to do now here with snapping and cloning. But as you can see here, you know, snap, taking a snapshot of this entire two-node Rack database happened in a matter of seconds, okay? And from that snapshot, right, I can, I can either... I can use that as sort of a, a, a way to augment my backup strategy, right? So I, over time, I might be able to, you know, I might want to roll back to that consistent point in time. Uh, and again, rolling back not just the data, but rolling back the configuration, right? If I had a, uh, added a node to that rack database and I need to roll back, I'd be rolling back to the, to the original, you know, incarnation of that the way it was initially provisioned, rolling back from a three node to a two node rack database. So we're rolling everything back. Um, so here, when I, when I create the clone from that snapshot, I'm going through a similar process as I would when initially provisioning the new database. Um, you know, I can, I can either keep all these things because they're essentially, with the exception, obviously, of the, of the networking because we need, you know, we need different IP addresses. Uh, it's capturing what it, what it knows to already be in place because I'm, I'm basing this clone on that snapshot. So, you know, the, the placement rules, all that kind of stuff is essentially going to default to, to what's sitting in the snapshot. But I have the latitude to be able to change these, you know, if I want. Okay. So creating the thin clone uh, from the snapshot is also a very efficient, uh, you know, efficient process. Um, it really, it's just a matter of minutes. Um, and then now, you know, I effectively have an entirely new, you know, standalone um, two-node rack database in this case that was based on uh, the snapshot from my original two-node rack, you know, rack database. Okay, and it was all done quickly and uh, and you know, again, conceivably by you know any any end user. Okay. So I've got the uh, you know the rack database here, and um, you can see in the, you know as I look at all my Oracle applications there, it it appears you know it's just another another app just like the original one from which it was it was uh, created. Okay. So that was cloning. Um, so let's look at uh, consolidation, right? So as we as we again as we look to try to you know, really maximize infrastructure utilization. Um, you know, we look to, to try to consolidate as densely as possible. And, and again, when we do that, we run into, uh, you know, typically run into challenges uh, with uh, the noisy neighbor effects of multiple disparate workloads running in the same, you know, pooled collection of resources, uh, whether it be compute, you know, or storage. And so, you know, what Robin provides, you know, first of all, is a, is a pretty rich, you know, multi-tenant type framework, including a rich RBAC layer, you know, role-based access control layer. So first off, there's, there's the ability to carve up the cluster potentially into multiple uh, isolated resource, uh, resource pools. So you can therefore deploy application components into certain resource pools, you know, guaranteeing that, uh, you know, that, that these workloads are isolated from other workloads in the cluster. So you have that technique, if you will, as, as the means for, for being able to provide, you know, a sort of degree of, you know, workload management. And then, uh, you know, anytime you've got the, you know, the, the ability to uh, support many users across multiple groups of users, multi tenants, in other words, you know, you need the ability through some sort of role-based access control mechanism to, to be able to set limits on these users, you know, ability to provision memory, to provision uh, CPU, um, so that no one user can gobble up all those resources, right? Um, so you can set limits and quotas uh, across tenants uh, for specific users within, you know, within tenants, um, and, and to give them, you know, uh, appropriate access uh, accordingly, okay? So, in addition to to that, right, another technique again, and a lot of this stems from uh, Robin's unique uh, storage proposition here with its AppAware storage. Uh, Robin actually tags all IOs with metadata that identifies the application initiating the IO, uh, all the way down to the specific storage volume to which that IO is is traveling. 
So I've never actually tried to see this slide on WebEx as it's being presented to me, so I, I don't know how well you guys can, can see this, but, but the idea here is to, to try to illustrate that even for a specific, you know, even for the same storage volume, two applications which might be sharing that storage volume uh, can be governed or throttled in terms of their I.O. consumption down to that storage volume. So you can set, you know, IOPS rules for example, to, to kind of govern, you know, how much storage uh, any particular application on a per volume basis can actually consume IOPS, okay? So uh, this is that, this is, you know, in addition to being able to control uh, CPU allocation, memory allocation, and be able to, to, to be able to change that flexibly, you know, dynamically over time, um, this is is the rest of that quality of service story that Robin brings to the table is through its through its storage layer, uh, app aware storage layer, being able to provide you know very granular control uh, over the way in which um, you know the resources, the physical resources in the cluster, might be consumable you know across all the different applications as they're deployed uh, across these you know virtual containers uh, throughout the cluster. Okay. Okay, so uh, scaling, right? So let's look at uh, how easily we can we can scale up first of all, right? So so any application that you pull up in Robin, uh, or that's actually been deployed in Robin, you can you can easily pull that application up. If you find that uh, you know that 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 application seems to be CPU bound, for example, at at some point in time, then you can very easily go out and uh, allocate additional compute for the container. Uh, that's uh, uh, that supports that particular ap application component, or in the case of a single instance Oracle deployment, of course, it's just it's just going to be um, you know for all of Oracle basically in that in that case. But the, my point there being that for a composite application in which the bundle itself is actually comprised of multiple multiple elements of the stack, you can on a per component basis uh, tweak the compute and or memory uh, for that particular you know, that particular component or role, uh, in other words. So, you know, for, so scaling up is really just simply a matter of using these slider bars and, and, and adding compute, adding memory. Um, the, the GPU scale here is, is typically reserved for those folks that are doing, you know, analytics, big data type, type activity. So there's, there's uh, you know, GPU support for that. Um, but it's as easy as that, right? So it's not about having to make a decision up front as to picking a small, medium, large, or extra large um, shape, if you will, uh, in, in this kind of otherwise, you know, private cloud environment. You just, you know, you can provision it according to whatever, whatever you, you know, think you might want, but over time, at any point in time, you can very easily uh, and granularly uh, slide up and down, scale up and down uh, the amount of compute and memory for that. Uh, so scaling out is the same thing, you know. And again, we're this is an Oracle presentation, so we're you know we're using Rack as an example, but there are many other examples of composite applications, um, you know, cluster distributed type applications where scaling out, uh, you know, makes equal sense. Uh, but scaling out is is very similarly done to to scaling up, right? So you know we just go and pull the application up. We uh, we say that we want to scale that out. And uh, in this case, we just say that we want to add, you know, we use the slider bar to scale out rack by one, two, three, or four additional nodes, and then, you know, just simply click scale out. And, and then Robin takes care of, you know, all the automation, you know, all the plumbing uh, behind the scenes, you, you know, in accordance with adding those uh, additional instances, right? Adding, first of all, the containers, but then uh, standing up the instances uh, and all the subsequent, you know, rack specific, Oracle specific stuff, you know, creating additional threads of redo and, uh, you know, all the related storage provisioning and so forth. Robin automates uh, every bit of that, okay? And it does it really in just, you know, just a matter of minutes, okay? Sorry about that. So, uh, so let me jump over and show you what that looks like. Realize we're coming up uh, coming up on time for Q and A. I'll try to hopefully get through this. So we had our two-node rack database, and you know a, a classic example of wanting to add another node, right? Obviously, if if you're CPU bound, you want to add a node. That's one, you know, that would be one use case for wanting to scale out. But um, 
but you might also want to test scalability of the application itself. You might want to say, okay, this thing is scaling pretty well from one to two nodes, but as I add a third node, how linearly is that going to scale, right? If you've got uh, you know, any experience with Rack, you're probably aware of the fact that, that that's the biggest hit that you take in scalability on Rack is going from two to three nodes. And so it's a, it would be a classic sort of you know, use case or test case to, um, to add a third node to, to determine the linearity with which it's able to, the app itself is able to scale on that, uh, on that cluster database. So, so we just simply say, you know, say that we want to scale out by one additional node. There was some provision in there to, to, to kind of tweak some of the, uh, some of the variables, but we didn't, we don't need to do that. So we simply say scale out, and then behind the scenes, Robin is going to provision uh, a new container, and then uh, once that container is provisioned, it's going to uh, activate the various hook scripts that are also part of that bundle for doing all the Oracle specific um, activity, you know, associated with. Um, creating a new instance, starting that instance, you know, mounting the database, you know, and all the various things, you know, associated with that, okay? So just a matter of minutes, you know, we were able to, to add that third node. So when we close that screen and the screen, uh, this screen here refreshes, we can see our third node, and we now have a three-node rack database, okay? In order to demonstrate that or to prove that, we, again, we can very easily jump down into the container itself. You know, this would be, again, just like jumping onto the, you know, SSHing onto the actual rack node itself. Uh, just set our environment. And again, I'll just use SRBCTL to do a status on the database. So we'll query the clusterware to see that, yep, we have three, now three instances running. You can see the newly provisioned um, V node. We can query some of the other node apps. You can see the you know the additional resources, cluster managed resources that were created. Go into SQL Plus again and just query the V dollar instance, or in this case the GV dollar instance view. And so we've got our third instance, and we've got our database that's fully active across now three nodes in, the, in the, the Oracle database cluster, okay? So it's as simple as that, okay? Now, uh, I believe in this, yeah, and this, so in this demo, I actually went and uh, conversely showed how you can scale back in, all right? So we can take any one of these nodes in the cluster and we can remove it, right? So we don't have to, we don't have to you know, deprovision the last one that we added, we can go in and remove the first or the second one uh, as well. So all we have to do there is just simply delete the, the container. And then behind the scenes, Robin is going to take care of all the necessary, um, you know, basically coordinating that with, you know, with Oracle, with, you know, with the grid infrastructure, um, you know, to, to deprovision that node, to deprovision, you know, the instance, um, you know, from the cluster registry, so that we now have a you know a cleanly pruned uh, cluster from three back down to two nodes. So this is you know this is important, right? This is the, it's important to be able to uh, to be elastic. You know, as you're trying to to make the best use of the of the physical cluster resources, you know, you need to be able to uh, expand and contract both vertically as well as horizontally. And uh, and so that's uh, you know that's why I think it's important to you know to be able to to scale back in, you know, a rack database um, as easily as it, as it is to scale it out. So we're just, re, you know, requerying the, the grid infrastructure again, just to, just to test and make sure that we have successfully removed that instance. And I think in the interest of time, why don't I just, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and flip back over to the presentation here. You know where that's going, right? So, so failover. So finally, you know, being able to uh, provide business continuity for the Oracle database without necessarily having to make the additional investment in, you know, a cluster manager 
you know, some sort of clusterware product, um, some sort of, uh, you know, storage vendors, uh, you know, product, um, or, you know, real application clusters itself, right? I mean, arguably, Rack is going to be the superior approach to providing Oracle Database HA, but not everybody wants to make that investment. Not everybody has has that sort of SLA um, in, in place that, uh, you know, to justify uh, that investment, but still has some sort of, you know, some sort of need for uh, for continuity, right? So it's important to note that, you know, with Robin, you know, Robin is automatically going to maintain um, the state of all the containers, right? If the state of that container is such that the expectation is that that container always be up and running, then Robin's going to do everything it can to enforce that. So in the event of a node failing, Robin's going to detect that the container has failed. Or if a container has failed on an otherwise healthy node, Robin is going to detect that, and Robin is going to restart that container automatically somewhere. And then all of the associated storage, you know, uh, migration, if you will, is also taken care of automatically. Again, Robin is, is fully aware of, of all the mappings from that particular application and uh, and its its container at that point in time with all the various storage volumes that had been provisioned to it and mapped to it, so it maintains that that mapping, and therefore is able to um, you know automatically remount that storage accordingly in the event that you know that that that's uh, that has to be uh, started back up again. Okay, so I actually do have a quick demo for that just to show you that come back up. Uh, and I know we're running we're running up on the edge of time here, but if y'all bear with me, this is actually a different environment here. This is actually a three-node Robin uh, environment. That's a different uh, non uh, sort of rack enabled environment, if you will. So I I have a single instance uh, Oracle database running here, and uh, what I want to do here is to show you. Um, a case where, you know, in this case, we can see that the instance is currently running, or this container is currently running on that EQX01 backend 10 um, system. That's actually the, the physical Robin host in, in the cluster. And, uh, and so what I'm going to do is I can show, first of all, uh, in a planned fashion, how we can, you know, gracefully migrate that container over to another node in the system, all right? So we might want to perform some sort of maintenance on EQX01 backend 10. Uh, so we might want to gracefully, you know, migrate or kind of live, you know, migrate, if you will, everything that's running on that physical host somewhere else in the cluster. And so this is what we've done here. We've we've just simply uh, moved that uh, all the app, or in this case, the Oracle application that was on that uh, on that box. We moved it over to EQX04. Uh, okay, so we can see there it's now running on that physical host in the cluster. Okay, but now. Let's show like an unplanned downtime event, right? So here we know that it's now running on EQX04 backend 05. And now what I'll do is I'll SSH into that box itself and I'll reboot the box. Okay, so let's just simulate a, a failure of that, of that host, okay? Right, so we had our Oracle instance that was that was running on that, and you can see here that uh, Robin has detected the failure. And so Robin is going to automatically migrate that back over to you know one of the other uh, healthy hosts in the Robin cluster. So as you can see here, it was in fact moved back over to EQX01 backend 10, and all of that was done you know done automatically. Okay. All right. So finally, uh, migration to the cloud, right? So you know, basically, um, you know, this is this is important to a lot of folks, right? Looking to to try to you know embrace the cloud, um, whether it be for some, if not all, of their their Oracle deployment. And so you know, there's there, there's a lot of ways to move an Oracle database or an entire Oracle Oracle stack into the cloud. Um, Robin makes it about as easy as anybody can, and uh, you know it can be done in a number of different ways. Uh, we talked about cloning earlier in the presentation with the related demo, and that's actually one of the techniques we can use. Uh, we can also do backups to S3 storage, and then use those backups to instantiate uh, the application in the uh, in the cloud. But this would be start out very similarly to to the way you might do any sort of clone. You first snapshot, uh, and so you've got a number of snapshots from which you might you know determine 
uh, to be the best uh, candidate or basis for that clone. You create the clone, um, and then you're essentially going to, you know, you've got your Robin uh, cluster running in the cloud, in whichever cloud it may be, um, and, and then you, you know, you move that clone into the cloud, and and uh, you know, and spin that up in in the cloud accordingly. So it's it's you know just about as simple as that to actually, you know, leverage that to be able to make that you know, make that migration. Okay. So I realize we only got about 10 minutes left for Q&A. Just you know, quick wrap up here. Um, you know, the value proposition of Robin is, you know, it's I think it's it's largely twofold, right? I mean, it's from a, from an ops perspective, it's about simplification. It's about making better use of the resources, the physical you know physical resources in the data center by in, you know maximizing utilization. You know, a lot less idle, you know, idle um, infrastructure out there. Um, fewer islands, if you will, uh, you know, better consolidation and, and, and maximization of, 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 uh, of that investment. Um, you know, providing various organizations, dev, test, you know, dev ops with, you know, with that self-service type capability and being able to keep folks isolated through, you know, a pretty, pretty good multi-tenant, um, you know, foundation built into the platform itself uh, is, uh, is key. And then, you know, finally from a, you know, from a from an agility perspective, right? Obviously, the containers bring a great amount of agility, right? But when you start to bring in the notion of having to stand up applications on containers, uh, that agility tends to be compromised without some framework in place to be able to, you know, provide the automation needed uh, to orchestrate the, the deployment of those containers, and particularly for for more complex applications, all the you know the plumbing and the stitching needed. Um, you know, among those different containers to make sure that all the pieces talk to each other, that they're accessible from outside of the container platform. Uh, you know, in other words, for the application connectivity in to the database. Um, from a Kubernetes perspective, there's a great deal of complexity with all, you know, understanding all the different Kubernetes resources that are in play to stand up any given application to ensure that all those pieces are talking to one another to ensure that they're exposed to the outside world and, and such. And so Robin, you know, abstracts all that complexity and, um, you know, and, and fills the gaps from a technical perspective and, and you know, through its storage and, and through the, you know, through the built-in storage and the networking and the compute to be able to, um, you know, to, to really, you know, really bring that to bear, really make that viable for, uh, you know, for all, all applications. Okay. So that's pretty much all I had. Um, I guess at this point we can open up to questions. You know, for more information, basically, uh, you know, I would encourage y'all to, you know, to contact us. Certainly, um, Tim Lawler would be your contact for for any, uh, you know, getting you routed to the right folks, um, whether it be me or, or or anyone else. You know, we're happy to to come out. We're happy to do, you know, whatever makes sense for for y'all as far as any kind of follow up, deeper dive type uh, discussions around the technology and. Maybe identify some use cases that you know that y'all may have, um, and uh, and once again, I appreciate everybody's everybody's time. So, with that, Shannon, I guess we could open it up to questions. Rob, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen in the Q&A section. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides and to the recording of this session for everyone. Uh, and Rob, early on there was a question that came in um, asking what is CPU cores? What are CPU cores? Correct. So the so in the well, so you can think in this context, you can think of a of a of a core as as essentially being like a, a VC you know a virtual CPU, right? So specifically, when we talk about allocating um, uh, CPU cores to an application or on behalf of an application, we're essentially taking what is otherwise physical CPU capacity on on that particular node where the where uh, where that container is running and we're you know we're we're practically reserving uh time on that you know on that CPU on that socket basically right from any one of those cores right the the, the presumption here is that it's a multi-core CPU um and uh and we're essentially reserving time on behalf of that particular container um, you know, because we, again, we're virtualizing the compute, we're virtualizing that physical CPU, um, and uh, you know, and basically just assigning a portion of that, 
changes that CPU or CPU core uh, to the application that's running on the container. Does that does that I hope that answers the question. I believe so. Um, and again, if you have questions, feel free to submit in the bottom right hand corner. Everyone's being very quiet right now. A lot of information you've given them, Rob. What's the most commonly asked question that you get from your customers? Uh, you know, we do. We, despite having mentioned it earlier in the in the presentation, um, we we do often get asked. You know, is there is there any kind of because because the whole notion of hyperconverged always throws people and and they ask is there any kind of hardware you, you know as part of the Robin solution and and so you know again no there's not it's a it's a pure software only product software defined everything is software defined including the storage and there's no dependency on any sort of cloud service um, any any sort of storage vendor you know this is actually something that you'll find if you if you're looking out there at some of the other orchestration vendors. Um, you know, and I won't name any names, but but they will quite typically look to either another storage vendor or another storage, a particular storage product line within their own, you know, within their own offering uh, within the company, um, because they don't, you know, the orchestration framework itself does not have, or does not, it's not delivered with its own built-in uh, storage stack, and so that that again is something that that really is unique to Robin. Uh, in its ability to, you know, to do a lot of the things that we talk about around uh, application awareness, you know, specifically the quality of service, uh, being able to get, you know, more granular and, and more intelligent with respect to um, placement constraints, um, you know, being able to, uh, you know, to do a lot of that stuff that, that is really dependent on, on app awareness in the storage, you know, to be able to do a lot of those, a lot of those things, the snapping and the cloning, again, you know, another example. So, and there's a question here, Rob, that just says licensing question mark. So, how do you handle that? So, that that is another. I'm a, well. I'm going to kind of take liberty with that one because it is. That's another common question: is the implication um, for like the Oracle licensing implication for bringing an Oracle database into this cluster, um, you know, a Robin cluster? Um, I'm assuming that that's kind of where that question stems. If not, I can maybe address the other side of that just from a pure Robin perspective. But, um, the, you know, Robin itself does not introduce any additional licensing implications. The implications are really the same, you know, from, a, from an Oracle perspective, the same as you are going to encounter with any other virtualization platform. Uh, so if, if you've ever successfully, and I challenge anyone to say that they have successfully uh, managed to uh, grasp the, the, the licensing rules, so to speak, as they relate to VMware, uh, as an example, uh, licensing the database, for example, in VMware, uh, I, could spend, I could spend hours talking about that. I dealt with that for years and uh, with all the Oracle VMware customers. Um, nothing changes. In short, nothing changes, right? So the economy with with regard to bringing Oracle into this kind of a platform, right? It, it's it's certainly going to be a function of how much Oracle you're you're retiring out, you know, on otherwise bare metal or perhaps even VMs, and and bringing into the Robin cluster because it's quite conceivable that there could be huge savings. I mean, we have a we have an Oracle a large Oracle customer right now, for example, running several hundred rack databases on Robin. For them, it, it was about um, it, it was about license management as much as it was self-service provisioning and all the good functional technical stuff that, that I talked about here. Uh, but they were able to significantly reduce their license spend or more specifically support spend um, by ultimately reducing the number of licenses required, you know, from their current state into their, you know, or, or I should say now their previous state into their now current state on, on Robin because, it, you know, the net, the net difference was far fewer cores. Um, and of course they were, you know, they were processor based in their, in their licensing agreement. And so, uh, but you could just as easily run into a situation where it might cost more. If you're just running, you know, one Oracle database today on four cores, um, you know, you've got two processor licenses. Uh, if it's on Intel, you pull that into a Robin cluster, you're more than likely going to have more, Rob, more cores in your Robin cluster, and that might, you know, result in a net increase in in Oracle licensing. But more often than not, it's going to be a savings. You know, again, predicated on, on on moving a lot of Oracle 
um, into you know into Robin because you are going to be able to do uh, as much as you're doing today with less uh, less hardware, less compute essentially, and you're going to be able to more successfully have all those different workloads you know co-located in the same grid so to speak. Um, you know, more successfully by way of some of the QoS, you know, capabilities and, um, you know, the resource management that we have, which simply is not available unless you're, unless you're running in Exadata or you're running on, you know, pillar storage or, or some, some specific storage subsystem which Oracle, where Oracle does have IO resource management. Um, you know, that's few and far between. So, you know, that's, that's what we're bringing to the table here. Well, Rob, that does bring us to the top of the hour. There is a quick, uh, there's a couple of extra questions here that I'll make sure and get to you and Tim uh, for for answers. Um, make sure we get those answers back to those attendees. Well, uh, thank you again for this presentation and thanks to our attendees for being so engaged and, and hanging out with us today. Um, thanks so much for everything and I really appreciate it and hope you all have a great day. Rob, thank you so much. Yeah, and thank thanks, you. Robinson. Yeah, thank you, everybody.